In this episode of the Partners Podcast, we will be talking with Jennifer Swafford, our clinical risk supervisor, about her path to partners, how the Partners Clinical Risk Team operates, and misconceptions about clinical risk as a whole. We hope you enjoy part one. everybody. Thanks again for joining the second episode of the Partners Podcast. To join us today uh, on our uh, discussion on clinical is our clinical risk management supervisor, who is Jennifer Swapper. Jennifer, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for having me, Vince. I'm glad to nope. be here. Yep, yep. And I know um, you're, in, you're in Georgia, correct? You're in the Atlanta area? I am, yeah, about 30 minutes outside of Atlanta. I always, like I said, I always like to start these discussions by talking about how we ended up in the insurance business, because I think we all have a unique story. And like I always say, we didn't find insurance, insurance found us. So kind of tell me a little bit about, you know, how you got into the business, your background. I know you're a registered nurse, how, you know, how you're, and how kind of your nursing career kind of led you to, to where you are today at Partners. Okay. Um, after several years of doing, um, uh, case management and uh, clinical manager in a home health setting, I went to work for a health plan here in Georgia, and I did case management there to start out with, and, but then I went into utilization review and then prowl off and got lots of different um, uh, experience doing that. And then um, partners um, reached out to me um, and wanted me to come to work there to, in the cost containment department. Gotcha. Yeah, you just how much now you just, and you assumed the range of supervisor what about a year ago, year and a half ago, or maybe earlier this year, correct? I couldn't remember. Uh yes, let's see. I know time is flying really. It was last summer. I think in maybe about June. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So I mean, how do you feel like your experiences as it relates to your previous things that you've done prepared you to kind of work in the in the stop loss world? Um, it, it really has. I've, I've done so many uh, different things in just a few jobs, but I, I, I've worked in so many. I started off in the ICU to have a lot of experience in disease process and sort of the um, big clinical stuff that uh, we look at a lot um, over here in cost containment. So I sort of know what happens and can read a lot of that, the medical stuff when they're going through because that's a lot of where the big dollar stuff is is when people are really critically ill yeah i mean working as an icu nurse obviously you know you you're going to see things um and, and especially in your current job how it relates to what your you can't people you just can't put something in front of you and just say okay this is acceptable because you're you, you you've been there mm -hmm. you've done that you've seen everything that occurs what does um is there anything, I mean, do you see, I, I mean, this might be a difficult question to ask, but I always wonder when people go through, like, for example, you work in an ICU unit, like mm -hmm. my, you know, I, I've, you know, I had some family members went through some surgery recently, and it just seems, do you find, do you pull any parallels between working in that unit and doing what you're doing in clinical? I don't know if that's a, if that's a crazy question to ask, but it seems in like- cost containment? Uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so when I, because when I'm working cost team, a lot of times we're looking at hospital bills and a lot of those bills are going to be um, uh, things we're reviewing that people have been in critical care in ICU, uh, where lots of different nurses probably haven't worked in that unit because it, it encompasses lots of different things from just different types of nurses. Um, so yeah, I can definitely pull from uh, the process of going through and seeing what they've built and what they've done it, it, to see if it was, you know, something that looks like it's supposed to be, if it looks to be standard of care, um, like they went into and did the uh, one, two, three, like they should, or if it looks like something was out of place to where I know that I need to go further with it and take a further look at it. Gotcha. Gotcha. 
So, so tell me a little bit about the clinical risk management unit, the unit itself that uh, we that you that you put together here at Partners. What like what are the objectives usually that you're trying to achieve on any particular uh, case? Uh, yeah, um, what we do try to achieve on every case is to work with the partnering uh, TPA or producer and try to uh, save uh, some sort of cost on it. Depending upon, um, it, we don't try to circumvent the PPO, but we're looking for billing errors or duplicates, uh, charges or uh, uh, level of care issues, that sort of thing. And um, we look at like the IBs, the itemized bills and the UBs, and uh, we're able to look at that and see if they look like they're supposed to, because being clinical and doing this for quite a while, you can look at these just from uh, with your experience and know if you need to send that off to a, to a vendor and have them have a closer look at it. And when you say you're talking about the UB82 forms that come in on the bill? Yes, the, gotcha. those, are the, those are the actual claims. The UB is the actual claims and the IB uh, is the itemized bill that um, shows everything they've done and everything they've billed for every item right mm -hmm. so i heard a comment once before that you could almost guarantee that probably 75 80 percent of all hospital bills are paid erroneously is that would you find that to be accurate is it yeah, there's going to be I'll, something I'll, probably I'll, on every one of them is it enough to worry with no but yeah there probably something on every bill you ever see that probably shouldn't be there just from human error um when, especially in a hospital setting, you've got so many different providers and clinicians going in and out of rooms and, and, and with people doing different types of care. And, you know, these days it's all automated. So a lot of times, you know, they're adding on stuff they shouldn't be and they don't realize it because they're clinicians like me, not people who bill out stuff. So a lot of times errors can happen in that way. Do you find that there are any particular claims that stick out that are more prevalent than others when you find these errors? Are there any particular um, procedures that, that you find to be more, um, yeah, that are more frequent when you find these errors or no? Um, it's usually the larger claims just because it's easier to miss when they, I, I'm assuming when they go back in and take a look at them because there's so much on them. I mean, there, there's a lot uh, of diagnosis and, and all it, the particular diagnosis is that, you know, that you would look for that would have probably more, um, maybe more errors and stuff on it would be um, if you're in there for sepsis, you're going to have a whole lot of things going on. Um, or if you have some sort of cancer um, and you might have a whole lot of different things going on if you've gotten really sick yeah. and went in and that sort of thing. Um, a lot of times you'll see a lot of billing errors on. What are what do you feel are some of the misconceptions of working with with your department and, and, and any clinical department when it comes to like I sure. said, the pre-sale is one thing, but post-sale when a claim comes in, like what do you feel are the misconceptions related to to what clinical does? Yeah, I think probably the, the biggest misconception um, with our cost containment department or anybody's cost containment department. Um, but with ours, especially because this is how we work, um, they worry most producers now that we're going to be trying to um, circumvent the PPO, which they uh, we do not do that. We are not looking to try to get a, a deeper discount when a PPO is in place. We are only looking at bill or, billing errors, um, duplicates, uh, level of care, things that are, are billed in error. Uh, and I think another one is that it takes uh, that I think they think we we take a lot of different um, of the claims and send them out and it's going to take a really long time. Very few that we look at do we send out to vendors and actually follow through with. That's why we do all of our you know in house we review all the notifications the claims here in house and we are you know. 99% sure, 95 to 99% sure that something is really, you know, the billing errors are significant enough for us to send out to a vendor because what we don't want to do is hold up people in paying the claim. So we do try to be very particular on the ones that we send out and the ones that we follow through with. Right. And generally speaking, because yeah, I think like you said, a lot of times is 
is the whole concept around timeliness or, or a timing set on a PPO discount? Is it is it and and maybe I'm, I may be venturing off in the weeds here, but is it is it is it even conceivable that a that a PPO could could say, hey, we're not going to pay we're not going to pay this claim or we're, we're not going to honor this because you missed the deadline to get it paid or whatever. And, and knowing that it's not usually going to take that long to have, have resolution. Uh, no, um, I've never had a PPO uh, not give the discount. Um, every um, place has a um, ability to review the claims that they're going to pay and the hospitals and the PPOs, uh, you know, obviously they, they know that that's part of everybody's contract that you can review what you're going to pay. So when we review something and we're asking for more information, that sort of puts a stop on the clock at that point and gives you more time to get the information you need to make a good assessment of a bill review. Uh, and it's it's pretty common that uh, people do. It's not out of the ordinary. We've never lost a discount while we've been working on one. The timing is pretty pretty reasonable, right? I mean, from the time that you get something to the time you come to some sort of resolution on it, right? Yes, I mean um, the the longest portion of uh, working on these is getting the information from the hospitals or from the provider that you're getting it from. It's not so much of when we're reviewing it or either our vendor, we're pretty quick within uh, two to three weeks, depending on uh, how, if it's just a very uh, simple one, you know, it can take less time, but more complex, depending on the complexity of the bill and how, and how large it is. But it's getting the IB, the UB, and the medical records, which we don't have a lot of control over. Right. right. Uh, that's what usually takes the longest. When working with producers, a lot of times that's usually the biggest complaint I get, or, or at least concern that they have is that the discount, they're going to lose a discount. And you know they're going to be you know the claim's going to get all messed up and we're, we're going to have a problem and and really but the reality is is it very rarely happens and typically they're always going to pay it's just a question of making sure and you should want the claim to be paid you know in a proper in a proper fashion so absolutely I mean for everybody that you know you're doing that for the group and to make sure they're paying what they're supposed to pay that's part of what you know I think is our responsibility to do. If we see something that the group shouldn't be paying, we definitely need to step in and you know and let them know that. Um, of course, through the um, uh, the producers and TPAs, of course. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What other op opportunities, or I should say, uh, services are available to to uh, to our producers through clinical? Okay. Well, um, not only do we do the bill reviews, we do um, high dollar drug reviews. Um, we have um, a vendor that's really good at helping us with our behavioral health type um, claims that we get because those are a little bit different to try to work on. And uh, we they have we have some vendors that have some really good programs with that. Um, we do transplant contracts. We place those along with the VAD um, contracts. Um, out of network, we do negotiations uh, with uh, different providers uh, to get a better. Um, discount on those uh, since there is no PPO in place that we can go ahead and, and negotiate with discounts on those. Um, we do uh, also neonate and preterm babies. Um, those are bill reviews too, but that's a little more specialty um, just because um, they're not as uh, common, of course, and those can be very high dollar um, claims. Gotcha. So a couple of things I wanted to touch on sure. the the out of the out of network piece. Mm -hmm. Are you are you negotiating that based on say a, a, a like an like a reference based pricing schedule or just trying to get the best price you can? Uh, how does that typically work? Okay, so we do we have vendors that also do that too that have um, usually um, uh, relationships with the provider, so they already have the person in place that they normally talk to, so they negotiate those for us. So in terms of, so obviously with the transplant process, it, there's a lot of coordination that needs to take place in order to make sure everybody's, you know, all, all on the same page. How does that work typically on, generally speaking, on claims and working on um, those situations with our producers? What's the process there and how that works? 
as the claims come in at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we have the contract here. If it's our contract now, it, it with that we work with the TPA or the producer to get, then um, we have the contract here, and our claims department has it, and they're able to pay the claim for the contract. The uh, the different contract people um, that we use, uh, the vendors and all, they they actually uh, reprice all the claims. They go through them and they're repriced, and they come into us. Gotcha. Okay. So if the claim comes in, it's usually already repriced. If it's not, then we we send it out back out to that vendor, and they'll reply reprice the claim. Yeah, it would it, it would seem to be that any any situation that comes in, any claim situation that comes in, you know, there's always going to be a degree of of communication and coordination with yes. with the producer, with the T, like say if there's a broker involved, and with the broker and the TPA. Um, explain that process, like what, in terms of your communication process with with producers on any claim, whether it be a transplant or otherwise that we're reviewing. How does how does that how does that come into play? Well, they um, now we look at lots of claims that we don't really uh, it, we don't really contact them unless we see something that we want to look at it because we're not holding up anything, just reviewing them because we review stuff. Right many times a day. But right. if we see one that we want to look a little further at, we contact the TPA or the, the, the producer and get the information so they know from the very beginning that we're reviewing it. And so we'll ask for like said, either the um, itemized and the, uh, the UB to start off with. Sometimes we'll go ahead and ask for the medical records because it does take a little bit longer, but we'll get that UB and the IB and get a preliminary review done. And at that point, uh, if the preliminary review shows that there is significant billing errors, then we'll go ahead with a complete review. And at that point, we'll call back the person that um, we've spoken to and get more information, let them know what's going on, that there's significant billing errors and we need medical records because we want to do a complete review at that point. Gotcha. So along the way, we're always talking because we're getting the information from them too. So they're always aware of where we're at in the process. Gotcha. You know, we've talked about, you know, there are kind of three, three areas of risk management for us. You know, one obviously being claims in your department, but talk to, talk about a little bit, you know, if you could, like, how do you coordinate with, uh, with Courtney's unit in medical underwriting? How, how does the coordination work there in terms of um, particular cases? I, I assume you guys use each other as a resource on certain things, but, but if you Absolutely. could share a little bit how you, how you work with, with medical underwriting. Uh, yeah, um, so with them, especially with renewals, if we see that um, we're working on something that is coming up for renewal, we uh, usually notify her to let if that, especially if it's a new diagnosis or a large claim or something of that nature, or they have like a, um, a medication that may be costly, um, we try to give her the heads up at that so she can take a look at it. Um, then. She also um, will um, call us for um, information like on different transplant stuff and all to help her with that end of it. Um, we also a lot of times, sorry, uh, we also a lot of times uh, drugs, uh, she'll uh, get drug costs from us. We have uh, one of the ladies that I work with is really good and uh, works a lot with uh, drug, high dollar drugs. So she's able to call her and get information on that so she can make uh, good um, decisions on um, any kind of drug issues, uh, pharmaceutical stuff that she sees coming through. Jennifer, thank you for your time today. This has been most informative, most helpful. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, appreciate everything you're doing for us at Partners and, and uh, good luck to you in the future. And uh, we'll just keep moving onward and upward. Thank you so much, Vince. You always make everything easy to do. I appreciate you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.